The pre-Socratic philosopher Democritus was such a prolific writer and influential thinker, he would quickly outshine his teacher, Leucippus. But together, they both stood out as the first philosophers to champion atomism, a materialistic philosophy that says that everything is made of incredibly tiny fundamental particles. While over 300 fragments remain of the writings of Democritus, only two remain from Leucippus, and later atomists like the famous Epicurus didn't even believe Leucippus existed. While Leucippus may have been the first to imagine a world of incredibly tiny particles interacting in lawful ways so that, as he says, nothing happens at random, but everything from reason and by necessity, it would be Democritus who really fleshed out atomism, leading to him being the main figure associated with the idea. When early scientists thought that they had found the fundamental particles of the universe and named them atoms, the fame of the early atomists would be ensured for the rest of time. But were the atomists famous or infamous in antiquity? Plato had such a hatred for the atomists that he wanted all the books of Democritus to be burned. Hey, I'm Matt, you're watching Nothing New, and today we're exploring perhaps the most prescient of all the pre-Socratic schools of thought, the atomists, stemming from the simple argument that if it is impossible to infinitely divide matter, then it must be that matter is made up of extremely tiny and indivisible particles. To the atomists, there could only be two things in the universe, these uncuttable atoms and the void that they move through. They not only anticipated particle physics and scientific materialism, but also seemed to be some of the earliest atheists. It was said that, some people think that we arrived at the idea of gods from the remarkable things that happen in the world. Democritus says that the people of ancient times were frightened by happenings in the heavens, such as thunder, lightning, and thought that they were caused by gods. Today we'll see that even the most modern ideas have ancient precedent. But first, want to see more videos on ancient philosophy? Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. We have new videos coming out every week. Anyways, let's get into it. The confidence of the earliest philosophers is remarkable. Some frame their philosophy as if it were a divine revelation, like Parmenides did. This isn't that crazy, since most of the important knowledge in Greek culture came from the muse-inspired poets. But it makes pre-Socratic philosophy hardly recognizable in terms of what we imagine when we think of philosophy. Most all of the pre-Socratics wrote poems until Empedocles, who was said to be the last to write in verse. Even the dialogues of Plato read like plays, which was a pleasant surprise when I began studying philosophy. The surviving works of Aristotle, in comparison, resembled dense lecture notes. Not because he didn't write flowing dialogues, but because none of them survive. In the writings of Democritus, we do not see flowery and far-reaching maxims, but structured inquiry and investigation. Democritus covered not only familiar pre-Socratic chestnuts such as embryology and why magnets attract iron, but also wrote books on mathematics and geometry, geography, medicine, astronomy and the calendar, Pythagoreanism, acoustics and other scientific topics, the origins of humans and animals, and even literature and prosody. Importantly, it is also clear that not only did he cover this wide range of topics, but he covered them in some depth, for instance, by raising and answering possible objections. He was therefore an important bridge between the dogmatism of many of the pre-Socratics and the fully-fledged philosophy of Plato. Since some of the basic questions and assumptions were laid out, a dialogue of questioning began in Greek philosophy. At this point, thinkers were mainly building off the thought of others. For instance, Anaxagoras had argued that the natural substances which are the basic building blocks of things were infinitely divisible. However much you divide a piece of wood, it will remain wood all the way. But it was presumably Leucippus, as the earliest of the atomists, who made an intuitive leap of genius and proposed that the world was ultimately made up of things which do not have qualities, as wood does. He said that if you were to continue to divide anything, at some point you would reach things which are not further divisible. They are atoma, indivisible. They were responding to Parmenides' criteria of being, that is, that for something to be ultimately real, it has to exist eternally. The atomists proposed that the infinite atoms in the universe were indestructible, and they are in eternal motion through the equally eternal void. According to Democritus, they also varied in size and shape. Everything was explainable by atoms, not gods or divine forces, and the works of the atomists are full of rational explanations for all sorts of natural phenomena. In atomistic philosophy, we generally find a deterministic universe, but thanks to random motion in the atoms, there can also be an allowance for free will. But they didn't believe in a soul, or at least they didn't believe it was anything more than fire atoms, putting forth one of the first philosophies that was strictly materialistic. 
death was simply the dissolution of a collection of atoms. Considering the scientific materialistic worldview wasn't popular until the last few hundred years, I think it's safe to say that these guys were incredibly ahead of their time. Democritus also had a lot of insight into how one should live, and he gives us good advice on how to be happy, saying that, Men achieve tranquility through moderation and pleasure and through the symmetry of life. Want and superfluity are apt to upset them and to cause great perturbations in the soul. The souls that are rent by violent conflicts are neither stable nor tranquil. One should therefore set his mind upon the things that are within his power, and be content with his opportunities, nor let his memory dwell very long on the envied and admired of men, nor idly sit and dream of them. Rather, he should contemplate the lives of those who suffer hardship, and vividly bring to mind their sufferings, so that your own present situation may appear to you important and to be envied and so that it may no longer be your portion to suffer torture in your soul by your longing for more. For he who admires those who have, and whom other men deem blessed of fortune, and who spends all his time idly dreaming of them, will be forced to be always contriving some new device because of his insatiable desire, until he ends by doing some desperate deed forbidden by the laws. And therefore one ought not to desire other men's blessings, and one ought not to envy those who have more, but rather, comparing his life with that of those who fare worse, and laying to heart their sufferings, deem himself blessed of fortune, and that he lives and fares so much better than they. Holding fast to this saying, you will pass your life in greater tranquility, and will avert not a few of the plagues of life, envy and jealousy and bitterness of mind. When we get into Hellenistic philosophy, we'll see atomism pop up again in the philosophy of Epicurus, who you'll see also knew some of the secrets of living well. But we'll have to save that for later. Now that we've covered pretty much all of the pre-Socratic philosophers, we have all the context we need to really appreciate the Greek world that Plato was living in and responding to in all of his works. Over the next few months, we'll be doing a deep dive into the three biggest minds in all of Greek philosophy, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Their enormous fame in the history of ideas lasts till this day, and it's for a reason. We're going to find out why. Anyways, that's all for today. Don't forget to like the video if you learned something new, and subscribe if you haven't already, and definitely let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.